Maybe may seated for just a moment. Welcome, Welcome to church. church. What a beautiful morning it is to worship our Lord together. Um, didn't get a chance to tell you to turn around and wave at everybody, so turn around and you know, throw everybody away. Tell them you love them. All the good stuff. <laughs> You'll notice there are connection cards on each end of the pew and tithing envelopes. Fill those out. Do what you need to do. The ushers will not come around and pick, and pick those up. You'll need to drop those in the uh, offering uh, boxes as you leave. Um, we have a volunteer opportunity at the Dream Center that we've kind of been talking about. The link to the volunteer application is in the email that you received from Pastor Paul on the What's What. If you're not getting that, please fill out a connection card so that we can get your information. Uh, and those help us to keep our information updated. Uh, we may not have all of your information, so please fill one of those out if you've not done so and take advantage of that volunteer opportunity in the What's What. Um, July 26th, we are having pastor with, no, not pastor, we're having pizza with Pastor Landon and Shelby for the youth. 
we're tentatively wanting to restart youth on the 29th, so this is going to give our youth an opportunity to meet Pastor Landon and Shelby, get to know them a little bit. Uh, the only catch with reopening youth is they will have to provide their own transportation. We will not be running the bus for that. So that being said, I think we're good to go. Will you stand with us again and sing? who has made it so that we can become new that because of his wounds that our souls can become healed that because of how deep his love is for us that he makes a way not just for us to cope 
not just for us to survive the crazy world and crazy times that we're living in, but he's made a way for us to come alive to him as he is alive. He is alive in love, in power, in truth and revelation, and he is making all things new. There is a future because of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who has made a way and who reigns over all. So join us in singing this last song about the worthiness of God, that he is worthy, that his name is above every other name, and it is worth building our lives on the revelation and truth of who he is. Worthy is his name. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. You're holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes. In wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. He is worthy. You're worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. You're holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
bow your heads as we pray this morning. Lord, we thank you for another day. We thank you for the opportunity to come into your house to worship you, Lord. We know that you are worthy. Worthy of every song. Worthy of every word preached. Worthy of every person here. And all of our praise. Lord, I pray that our praise would roll up to you and it would be, it would be sweet to you. For you are worthy. Lord, I pray that you be with uh, Pastor Heath as he comes. I pray that you would be with the teaching of your word as he teaches your truths to us. I pray that your spirit would mold us and shape us, God, more into the image of Christ, more in love with you, Lord. You are the reason we are here. And God, I just pray for all those that need a healing hand today, all those going through a rough time that need peace, Lord. I pray that you would bless them, Lord. There are those in this building, there are those in your church, there are those in the world that need a touch from you, Lord. And I pray that your healing hand would be upon them through anything, through any bad news, through any circumstance, Lord. You are enough to sustain them. And Lord, again, I just pray for your spirit to fall in this place. Mold us and shape us more into the image of your son. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, for those of you who don't know, uh, I am Pastor Heath, and uh, I am so grateful to be uh, a part of this church and a part of the pastoral staff here. Um, I, I'm so excited for what God is going to do here. We have got some really cool people uh, on staff. I was a solo pastor for the last 10 years out in Oakway, and so there was a lot, I mean, I, I'm not used to going into the office and people being there, and I'm like, okay, y'all going to have to get out and let me work, but um, I just want to thank all of you for how you've welcomed uh, my family and I and the generosity you've shown us. And uh, we're anxious for things to kind of get moving again and, and uh, just to be involved in more ministry here. Now, this morning, I want to share with you a little bit of my story and the impact that Scripture has had on my life and also kind of you know, appeal to you on why we need to return to the study of God's Word in our personal lives, in our homes, and in our churches. Uh, I grew up about 15 miles from here in Pendleton, South Carolina, go Bulldogs, and right between Liberty and Anderson is Liberty Highway. I grew up on a farm called Mole Meadow Farm. Uh, it's not far from All Goods Tires. Everybody, a lot of people know where that's at. Not far from Circle M Barbecue, some great barbecue. Uh, go in there, tell Mary and I sent you. He will give you no discount. Uh, so we had an Angus beef farm, and let me be very clear. I know a lot more about beef consumption than I know about beef production and processing, okay? Don't ask me anything about that. You want to know how to grill a steak, cut a steak, eat a steak, I'm your man. You want to know how the steak got there? Not your guy. Talk to my dad about that. I grew up in church. Uh, like most good Baptists, I got saved and then rededicated my life about 172 times, uh, but grew up in a good family. And the summer after my sophomore year of high school, 1991, we went to camp, uh, it was called Somersault, down at White Oak Conference Center in Winsboro, South Carolina. And as we're getting ready to leave on Sunday to go to camp, my youth pastor says, hey, I just want you to know I put you in a special class at the camp. And I'm like, am I, am I really that bad, Jim, that you put me in a special class? He's like, no, it's for leaders. And so this will be a good experience for you. I'm like, cool, so get down there Sunday and, and Monday and, and even into Tuesday. And for the first time in my life, a call to ministry is crossing my mind. It's being presented to me. It's being talked about. And when I was growing up, you had three options during an altar call. You could either get saved, you could rededicate your life, or you could uh, commit to full-time Christian service, which they never really explained what that meant. And I never saw anyone go up for that one. So I just assumed it was bad and I would avoid it. So I'm at camp, and for the first time in my life, this is, God is clearly speaking to me about a call to ministry. And Tuesday morning we got up, and the, the camp speaker said, hey, our scripture this morning is Psalm 119, so go out and do your quiet time and, 
And that's the scripture we're reading. So I went out, and there's a huge field out behind the big building. There's a big field overlooking the lake. And I get out there, and I'm cool, even though I'm doing my devotions, because I got my sunglasses on. And I sit down there, and I open up my Bible to Psalm 119, and it's not there. And I, and I, and I, and I look again, it's not there. And I'm looking at two blank pages except for three verses. Now, I, I'm like you. I don't believe that either. But I was there, I took my sunglasses off, put them back on, and I'm like, what in the world is going on? And the only thing I could see on the two pages was Psalm 118, verses 5, 6, and 7. Now, here I am, for the first time in my life, considering a call to ministry. I'm scared, scared out of my mind, I have no idea what that means. And these are the verses that the Lord gave me. Now, when I was growing up, we used the NIV 84 edition. It's no longer available, but all the scripture I memorized is the NIV 84, so that's what we're going to see on the screen. Psalm 118, 5, 6, and 7, this is what it says. In my anguish, I cried to the Lord, and he answered by setting me free. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I will look in triumph over my enemies. And right there in the middle of that field, just me and the Lord all alone, I knew in that moment it was a clear sign, it was a clear word from the Lord. He, I'm calling you into ministry. And I just remember saying, Lord, you are out of your mind. But I'll do it. I think you're making a big mistake here. Uh, I know there's some of you here that grew up going to camp, and if you ever want to know why we do a quiet time at camp, it's because of that moment. And I pray every year when kids go out to do their quiet time that somebody will look at their Bible and the words won't be there, that that God will just say something amazing to them. So the way the camp worked is they only did an altar call on Thursday night. So I'm I'm Tuesday morning, I'm called to ministry, I'm ready to go. Tuesday night, no altar call. Wednesday night, no altar call. Thursday night, they get ready for the altar call. I'll never forget. I'm like, they haven't even started yet. I'm already pushing my way to the end of the row. I go forward. The counselor's not expecting me. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa man, slow down. We're not ready for you yet. I'm like, man, I'm called to ministry. I got to tell somebody. He's like, well, let's go get your youth pastor. You talk to him. I went, and uh, Jim Smurl was my youth pastor. And I just remember saying, Jim, I know God's calling me. I'm just scared I'm going to fail. I'm scared I'm not good enough. And at that point in time, your three options were, or your options were senior pastor, youth pastor, music leader, missionary. None of those really appealed to me at that time. If you had told me back then one day I could be a media and communications pastor and work at, like Facebook hadn't even been invented. Kids, this was in the 20th century. We didn't have the internet. Like they had just invented the postal. So it was, it, you didn't have options. And, I, and Jim said, you know what, Heath, God never calls you to do something that he's not going to equip you to do. Uh, I called my parents after that. I forgot to share this in the first service. I called my parents. I said, Mom, I need to tell you guys something. I've been called to ministry. And my mom said, I know. I'm like, what? She's like, when you left for camp Sunday, I asked your dad, what are we going to do if Heath calls us this week? And says he's been called into ministry. And my dad said, well, we're going to support him no matter what. And they have throughout this uh, this whole time. Here's what I want you to know. Scripture gives us power to pursue our purpose. We are all created to serve, bring honor and glory to God, and to be a reflection of his love to the world. But each one of us takes a different path to fulfill that purpose. Some of us are pastors, some of us are teachers, some of us are mechanics or plumbers or whatever you do. In our own way, God gives us gifts and talents to fulfill the purpose. But these verses in Psalm 118, you don't understand how many times they have kept me on the straight and narrow. How many times I had to choose between right and left, right and wrong, and you get there. And when you have that tension in your life, there's an anguish. And in my anguish, I cried to the Lord. And time after time again, when I was faced with a major life decision, I would go back 
And I would realize there was nothing to be afraid of because the Lord was with me because he was my helper. And what can man, what can man do to me? Like really, what can they do? They say something bad about me? Yeah, I don't care. I really don't care. You're short. Hey, yeah, I'm short. Yeah. Is that all you got? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm overweight. Hey, yeah, what you got? I'm not that smart. Yeah, okay. What you got? Like what can man do to me? But we, listen, oh my goodness. Y'all have to excuse me. I, I try to stick to notes, but sometimes I just get to going and it's like a wind-up thing. I'm a, a wind-up monkey that starts going like that. That's me. Uh, I have doubted my salvation more than I've doubted my calling. There have been times in my life where I was like, man, am I really a Christian? Did I, did I really believe in Jesus? I, but I have never doubted for a moment that God called me to ministry because I remember that day, I remember that scripture, I remember that moment. Now, I've doubted whether or not I'm fulfilling that calling. I've doubted whether or not I'm up to the task and the challenge. I've doubted if my character was where it needed to be to really be a man of God like he had called me to be. But I've never doubted because when, that, when he, he put that scripture deep down in my soul and I see so many people today and they don't have any scripture rooted deep down in their soul that anchors them to a firm foundation that keeps them when the wind comes and the rain comes and life comes something that keeps them solid as a rock in their purpose and in their calling there's been times I've been afraid there's been times I've been in anguish and every time, Scripture has given me power to pursue my purpose. I mentioned that my youth pastor was Jim Smurl. He was a student at Southern Wesleyan University. And so when I went to Southern Wesleyan, that's where I really learned to study the Bible and, and, and learn uh, for myself. I also discovered that there are lots of verses and lots of sayings that we like to quote that aren't in the Bible and that Jesus didn't say. How many of you have ever heard the saying, the Lord helps those who helps themselves? How many of you have heard that? That is not in the Bible. It might be on your bumper sticker, but it's not in the Bible. The Lord did not say that. If I'm not mistaken, some Chinese philosopher said that. So when you feel like you're passing down some godly wisdom, I am sorry to break the news to you. Here's another one. There's like a million of these, but I'm just going to share two. Here's the other one. How many of you have heard this one? God won't put more on you than you can bear. How many, how many of y'all have heard that? That is not in the Bible. That is a verse that is taken completely out of context. Here's what it actually says. 1 Corinthians 10 Verses 12 through 14. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. That scripture, that quote we've been saying... It's talking about temptation. Paul is reminding us that God, even though it doesn't seem like this a lot, God has Satan on a leash. Satan can't do anything without permission. And God knows our limits when it comes to what we can resist temptation-wise. And we will never, God promises us, we will not be tempted beyond what we can resist. But we like to say things like, well, the devil may even do it. Or, you know, we pass the point of no return. Yeah, no. God says there's always a way out. There is never more temptation than you can endure. I think that there are a lot of people who have left the church and left the faith because somebody told them, hey, God won't put more on you than you can bear. And then what happened to them? Life happened. Bad things happened. They lose their job, they struggle, stuff happens in life, and it feels like more than they can bear. And they're like, 
Well, they told me that God won't put me up more on me than I can bear, but it sure feels like it in either their line or God's line, and I'm done with it because it's not true. And here's the thing. Scripture helps us process our pain. When we go to Scripture, we find a whole cast of characters who God put more on than they could bear. Jesus even tells us that this is going to happen. John 16, Jesus is telling the disciples, hey guys, uh, going to die and it's going to be bad and it's going to be terrible. And then he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And when we are going through tough things, when we lose a loved one, when we feel like everyone is against us, when we feel like the world is going crazy, we can look at Scripture and we find people just like us. We find people that God put more on them than they could bear. Can you imagine Jonah gets spit up on the beach for being in that, the belly of that fish for three days? Can you imagine somebody going up to Jonah and like, well, Jonah, good job. God doesn't put more on you than you can bear. Can you imagine he's just sitting there smelling and probably vomiting and he's like, what did you just say? You want to go in there? You want to try that out? Can you imagine going up to Elijah? Elijah defeats the prophets of Baal, calls a fire down from heaven. And what does he do? Does he throw himself a party? Yeah, kind of. He throws himself a pity party. He goes into a cave. He's like, oh, this life is terrible. I want to die. God, just kill me now. That's a man that has more on him than he could bear. That's a man that's just went from the mountaintop, and now he's trying to jump off a cliff. Can you imagine walking up to Job? Job, he's just lost all his children. He's just lost all his possessions. He's got boils all over his body. He's got three friends just giving him the worst advice ever. Can you imagine walking up to him like, hey, Job, God doesn't put more on you than you can bear. I'm telling you, Job is going to punch you in the face. And not like a wrestling punch, a real punch. You know, he's going to get you. God does not put, he does. God, I, like, if no one's ever told you this, God will put more on you than you can bear. It, you will feel like life is crushing you. You will feel like you can't breathe. And that's when the good stuff starts. You look at all these people in the Bible. All of them. Job ended up with more than he started with. Jonah preaches an entire city is saved. Elijah probably the greatest thing he did was passing his blessing on to Elisha. They all were crushed, bruised, and battered. But it was in those moments that God showed up and they truly were able to cling to the promises of God. And so when you and I are going through the worst that life throws at us, we can turn to God's Word and we can find comfort and we can find companionship with these same people. People who know what it's like to lose a loved one. People that knows, who know what it's like to experience great tragedy. And it's in reading God's Word and in seeing their struggles and their journey that Scripture helps us process our pain. And the more pain that I have suffered in my life, the more I relate to the people in the Scripture. And the more pain that I have suffered in my life and you suffered in your life, the more hope we can give to others. Because if you ever lost a job or gotten a bad medical diagnosis, when somebody gets in a fender bender, it's like, man, how am I going to get my car fixed? Well, let me tell you, God is good. Because if He can heal from disease, He's going to take care of a car. Now, you might... He just takes care of it. And we have to help people walk through that journey. Um, in 2014, 
Um, so my wife had, had a disease called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is like having Parkinson, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and ALS at the same time. Doctors refer to it at the, as the devil's disease. It is awful. There's no cure for it. It's hereditary. Um, my wife has two sisters and a brother. All three of them tested negative for it. Her dad had it. He passed away from it. His brother passed away from it. And in 2014, we finally came to grips that uh, my wife has this. She had tested you know, positive for the gene back when we first got married, but she had started showing symptoms, and we start going through the process of, of getting treatment. Now, they can't treat the disease. They just treat the symptoms. And the symptoms are everything that you have with, with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. It's, it affects your mind. It affects your body. It, it affects everything. So that's pretty bad, right? So a couple months after that, our a home that we owned on Martin Sausage Road in, in Pendleton, uh, it was the home we were renting out. It was the home. It was kind of our retirement home. It burns down. I get a call one morning, hey, your house burned down. Okay? That's pretty bad. Then, not too long after that, I get a call. Hey, your daughters have been in a jet ski accident. Uh, daughters got hit by a jet ski. Karis had a compound fracture of her left leg. They went in, did surgery. We had to go back the next week because it was in a lake, and so it got infected. She had to go rehab. Let me tell you, during those times, I was like, Lord, this is more than I can bear. But there was another scripture that I cling to during this. And it's a scripture, we can all quote it, Philippians 4.13. Let's quote that together. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? Now, some of us quoted NIV, some of y'all quoted KJV, it's all good. We leave out verse 12. So let's read Philippians 4. Verse 12 and 13, this is what it says. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13 is not about finishing a race. Philippians 4.13 is not about getting 100 on a test that you did not study for. Philippians 4.13 is about surviving. When Paul writes this, Paul's like, hey, I know what it's like to be in jail. Know what, it likes, know what it's like to be free. Know what it's like to eat. Know what it's like to be hungry. And I can do all of it. And so as I'm going through all of this, I understand that through Christ, I can endure it all. Whether it's a mountaintop or a valley, I can endure it all because Scripture changes our perspective to see the possibilities. And when I dig into the Word, I stop looking at my circumstances and I start thinking about the opportunity. I, it changes my perspective from being inward focused to outward focused. When you've been through something, if you've been through an illness, man, when, you, when somebody comes, comes along that's going through an illness, man, you have a heart for them. And you just want to come alongside of them. And you almost look for opportunities to do that. At Christmas of 2018, uh, if you had, I pretty much knew that within a year, we were not going to be able to take care of Karen at home anymore. I, I thought we had about a year. Her sister was living with us. Her sister used to be a nurse. Uh, but it was just getting more and more difficult. And this was a shock to us because Huntington's disease normally hits you in your mid-30s, which it did my wife, and it normally takes about 10 to 15 years. It just wears your body out. Um, Huntington's disease doesn't kill you, uh, but for example, like her dad, we saw him on a Saturday. He was starting to get a cold. That cold killed him two days later. Your body can't fight off anything. And so... Karen passed away a month, less than a month after Christmas, January 18th, 2019. And there were days during that period, I, you know, there's a couple of things I remember. It was just that every day was, all right, Lord, what's the next 
right thing I can do? What is the next thing today that I can do through you that gives me strength? Maybe it's pay the water bill. And I, you know, when you're going through a hard time, you feel like you deserve a gold medal for paying the water bill. I'm like, what, Lord, what is it? And, and the Lord gave me such a great peace that during those last days, you know, there was different family in the house and they were staying up all night with a Karen. And I, I just felt the Lord say, he, you need to sleep. I'm like, well, Lord, I don't, I want something to happen while I'm asleep. He's like, no, just sleep. And all that week that she passed, I slept through the night. And then we all got to be together when she passed away that Friday night. Our whole family was there. And it was, it was hard. It was hard. But, man, God has used that in such a way in our lives. When you know that there are periods of time where there's somebody praying for you in every time zone around the world, that does something to you. That changes you. I mean, that gives you a faith and a hope that a lot of people don't have. And I wouldn't have near the faith that I have if I had not been through all the hard things I had been through. I, I remember one time I put on Facebook, hey, if you're praying for me to have patience, you can stop now. Because God, if you need patience, God does not just like give you a dose of patience like Pixie does. He sends you to Walmart when there's only one register open and there's 100 people there and you got to wait in line. Right? Or he, he, you're in traffic and the person in front of you obviously does not know how to drive. And, you know, you want to say things to them and wave at them. And you want to do things. That's how the Lord teaches you patience through tough stuff. And what's happening in our society, I mean, the world is in chaos. I don't know if you know this, the world's in chaos. But here's the thing, it's always been in chaos. We just have 24 hours, like we just have access 24-7 to see that the world is in chaos. And we have people who do not have a foundation of faith and a foundation of Scripture in their lives to anchor them through these difficult times. We have people who are being blown to and, to and uh, fro. And we have got to, as Christians, as a church, as, hu as, as husbands and wives and fathers and mothers, we've got to dedicate ourselves to the study of God's Word. There are so many false teachers out there giving false hope and teaching fake theology that many of us are getting caught up in it and getting pulled further and further away from the truth. I mean, we believe that God doesn't put more on us than, than we can bear, right? We believe little things like that because we don't go to the Word to check it out. Everything I said today, listen, you need to go home, rewatch it on Facebook, and you need to go in the Word. Like, now see, he says something when in the Scripture, and what do you do? You come to me, it's like, now he, you said something, and like the Bible says something different, and then we kind of work it out. Don't put it on Facebook, our pastors are more. I mean, everybody knows you that Pastor Heath's a moron. You're not going to be telling him anything. But that's how we work it out. We work out our salvation with fear and trembling with each other as a family by going to God's Word. But like when I was a kid growing up, everybody took a Bible to church, right? Everybody had a Bible. But now, you know, some of us have Bibles on our phones. When my grandfather died, he had three Bibles by his living room chair. He had three Bibles on the kitchen table. And he had three Bibles in the bathroom. And it was nine different versions. And these weren't just regular Bibles. These were Bibles that were falling apart. These were Bibles that had been highlighted and written in and, and had his notes in it. This was a man who was studying the Word of God. This was a man that if he sat down to debate his own pastor, he would be smarter in the Scriptures than his own pastors. And if we do not commit ourselves to God's word, we are not going to change anything in this world. If God cannot use his word to change us, how are we going to change anything else? Scripture, it gives us power to pursue our purpose. Scripture helps us process our pain. And Scripture 
changes our perspective to see the possibilities. So here's my challenge for you today. First of all, get a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, listen, I guarantee you, if this is a Wesleyan church worth its salt, we got some Bibles. So if you're here today and you do not have a Bible, we will get you a Bible. There's probably, well, these are all hymnals. We'll give you a hymnal too. I mean, we'll give you whatever you want. Oh, we got Bibles over there. Listen, just take one. I'm, I'm serious. If you don't have a Bible, don't leave without one. Okay? Also, here's the second thing. Used to be you had to have like a special code to get all the, 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 the books that pastors had that taught you about Scripture, and they were like $1,000. You don't have to have that anymore. You just have to have internet. And most of us have that on our phone. There are so many amazing resources out there to help us learn more about the Bible. And then you just need to ask God to transform you by the renewing of your mind, by the reading of His Word. And if we will commit as men and women to get into God's Word and it starts stirring up stuff in us, that gets contagious. I was telling somebody this morning, it might have been Pastor Randy, every time I preach, even if I've had it planned weeks in advance, something always happens the week I'm about to preach. Uh, just to challenge me or just, just kind of put it home to me. And for me this week, it's been, you know, this is all very true for me. But I want to make this true for my kids as well. And so the Lord has just been challenging me this week of how I can be a better teacher of the Word to my own children. It's not the church's job to disciple your children. It's your job to disciple your children. We're going to help you. Man, we're going to partner with you. It's going to be awesome. We cannot wait. I cannot wait uh, for, for kids and youth. That we, listen, we, we live for that. But we want to help you understand God's Word so you can share it with your children. And that's what, we, that's what we've got to do as a church and as a community. Listen, it used to be that we were uh, biblically literate. We knew and we understood God's Word. And we live in a society today where children, they're not just uh, illiterate of the Bible they're illiterate, period. We live in a day and age where you have kids getting passed into fifth grade and sixth grade who cannot read. I had a friend that I went to college with, and he could not write a complete sentence. And he had to have somebody help him. I'm like, dude, how did you, what in the world? How did you get all the way through this? And we have children in our community and we're trying to instill God's word for them. And it's a word they can't even read. And what an opportunity that as we're teaching kids to read and we're teaching them critical thinking skills, that we can come alongside with them and like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his word. Let me tell you what these words mean. Let me tell you what this word can do for you. This word will change your life. And I stand before you today as living proof of that. This is... It might be my story, but I am not the hero of this story. It is about what Jesus Christ has done in my life. And I am so, I tell people all the time, I fully believe my best days are ahead. I don't want you to think, man, Pastor Heath, man, he's just kind of coming in and just, he's all worn out and stuff. Let me tell you, man, I get up 5.30 in the morning, I'm ready to go. And I hope we all can work together. And I'm excited to see how pickings can be transformed through this church. And I believe that's going to happen, and I believe it starts when we recommit ourselves to God's Word. So will you do that with me today? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for these people. Lord, I believe with all of my heart we are entering a season in this place, in this church. I believe that there have been seeds planted here, seeds of great, pastors and men and women in the past and I believe you have stirred something here and I believe you are going to do an amazing work here Lord you brought a great pastoral team together but Lord there's a great group of people already here and I believe in this time and in this moment 
that, Lord, we're going to be a light in our community. I believe there's going to be families repaired. I believe there's going to be people saved. I'm going to believe there's, there's, there's kids who are going to, uh, Lord, have their lives transformed. So I pray, God, you would instill in us a passion for your word, a passion uh, for your presence, and use your word to transform us and to give us a hope and a word and a, and a, a testimony so that we can come alongside the people in our community who are in need and who need a Savior. Lord, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray your blessings on each person here, each person watching online. Go with us and lead God and direct us. In your name I pray, amen. Uh, God bless you. The ushers will come and dismiss you. Uh, Have a great week, and we'll see you all soon.